Welcome back to Economics. This is Dr. Kling. I want to use the aggregate supply and aggregate demand diagram and the Phillips curve, which is another way of looking at aggregate supply, uh, to talk about some important episodes in economic history. And that's that'll help illustrate how economists use this aggregate supply, aggregate demand framework. So remember the two diagrams are the two ways of looking at aggregate supply and demand. We have something called long run aggregate supply, which is or gives gives us something what we sometimes call Y bar, the full employment <coughs> level of output. We have short run aggregate supply. That's this. And then we'll have an aggregate demand curve. Aggregate demand. And that'll tell us where we are in terms of output and prices. And then another way of doing the same thing, we have inflation. So it's the rate of change of price prices. As opposed to the level of prices over here, we have the rate of change over here. And then we use the unemployment rate <coughs> as our um, measure of economic activity. And of course, when unemployment is going up, this way, activity is going down. So the, and we call this the Phillips curve. And there's also a long run Phillips curve which is again vertical. So long run Phillips curve. And we might call this U star and U star is sometimes called the natural rate of unemployment or it's sometimes called the non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment. Non, I'm just going to put the initials. Non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment. So those those, <coughs> those terms will be used to describe this long-run Phillips curve. Okay, so that's our background. Now I want to do some quick historical stories about that. First we have the 1930s. In the 1930s we're not talking about the Phillips curve. We don't use that mechanism. But we do talk about aggregate supply and demand. And what we think happened in the 1930s is a very sharp drop in aggregate demand that put us way over to the left. So if this is our long run aggregate supply, maybe aggregate demand was starting to fall <coughs> a little bit in the late 20s, but then in the, sorry I've got to label my axes, um, but there was this huge drop in aggregate demand. So that's the story that economists tell about the 30s. Uh, it could have been in part the stock market crash. It could have been bank failures. Uh, it could have been just other deflationary things. Um, there, it was also a period of, of a, a housing bust like what we had recently where the price of farmland and other housing fell. So there could be a bunch of things. And then in response to that, <coughs> you know, the policymakers in the 1930s didn't have this aggregate supply, aggregate demand framework that hadn't been developed. Uh, they had a vague intuition that they needed more inflation. So there's this vaguely they vaguely thought needed more inflation. Okay, and that intuition was right, but the way that they 
they sought it was kind of peculiar. So one of the things that Herbert Hoover thought might work would be to get big business and labor together and agree to kind of try to stabilize prices and employment. So you would get big business uh, to sort of to not cut prices, not cut jobs. And uh, Franklin Roosevelt continued that policy, which I will call corporatism, that is working with corporations uh, to try to, uh, in a way, reduce competition. So to reduce competition. And the centerpiece of Roosevelt's New Deal was something called the National Recovery Administration, which was an organized way of reducing competition. It was a government, whereas Hoover was doing it informally, Roosevelt did it formally and through legislation. Um, and economists would now say that that, yes, that raises prices, but that raises prices by a uh, contractionary supply policy that the NRA was reducing, shifting aggregate supply to the left, which is not what you want to do. That actually hurts the economy. And so the general consensus is that things like Hoover's corporatism and Roosevelt's NRA were adverse policies in the, in the Depression. Instead, economists would say you want to increase aggregate demand, and that would be things like expansionary monetary policy, which we haven't talked about, and expansionary fiscal policy. Well, both Hoover and FDR had fiscal expansions. That is, they ran, lar they ran budget deficits, although not consistently, and they raised government spending, although from a low base. So they tried <laughs> some fiscal expansions. The difference is that Hoover kept a very contractionary monetary policy, but FDR uh, helped expand monetary policy by taking the U.S. off the gold standard and also by um, the bank holiday which sort of re which kind of uh, put eventually put a stop to bank failures. So FDR helped to increase aggregate demand uh, in from about in the early 30s and that brought about a bit of a recovery so there was some recovery from 1933 to 1937, and we can draw that as going from, let's say, here to here. So again, this is aggregate supply. So we moved a little bit, but we didn't move very far relative to long-run aggregate supply. And then we had a recession in <coughs> 1937. So even though we still weren't out of the Depression, we kind of moved backward. And there's some arguments about why that happened. Uh, some people point out that the fiscal expansion stopped and reversed. Um, and some people point out that the Federal Reserve raised reserve requirements, which we'll talk about later, it was a contraction of monetary policy. So, but for whatever reason, you get this aggregate <coughs> demand decline. So even though we weren't out of the recession, we sank back into a uh, worse recession. In fact, in our, our fa my family, I understand that my grandfather uh, went bankrupt not in, in the early part of the Depression, but in the Roosevelt Recession of 1937. So the bottom line is we hit World War II, and we still were somewhere over here with very low aggregate demand. And then the story is that World War II brought about a huge increase in aggregate demand, 
And so we went from a lot of unemployment to the essentially full employment, maybe even over full employment. If this is your long run aggregate supply. So World War II really shifted aggregate demand to the right. Again, this is the mainstream story. An interesting question is how the United States managed to come out of World War II without sinking back here. And there were economists who expected that. And um, I don't think, I th well, the, <coughs> the one answer that people will give is that during World War II, and in, there was, there built up something called pent up demand. That is, people, because production was going towards war goods, uh, production could not go to things like household durables and housing. And so there was this pent up demand that was unleashed after World War II and that kept aggregate demand high. So that's a story of the 1930s using aggregate supply and aggregate demand. I think I'll save for next time some uh, further history that talks about the Phillips curve.